Today we're pleased to have Dr. Barb Barlogi with us for a discussion on multiple myeloma. Dr. Barlogi is a professor in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology. He received his medical degree in Germany, after which he completed his fellowship training at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. He had previously headed the Myeloma Institute at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, which he founded 26 years ago. Under his leadership, multiple myeloma has become a curable disease when applying his total therapy approach, meaning using all active agents up front, followed by tandem melphalan-based uh, autotransplants, consolidation chemotherapy, and maintenance. He's now focusing his attention on the 15% of patients presenting with genomically ill-defined high-risk multiple myeloma by applying metronomically scheduled chemotherapy and targeting mutations. He currently serves as director of the Myeloma Research Center here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Barlow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was really it in a nutshell. Are there any questions? <laughs> right, so I advance this, I guess. No. Help me out. Where do I click to advance? Maybe. Which button do I click? Okay, okay, got it. Well, this uh, slide shows a few data um, about uh, myeloma's uh, epidemiology. Uh, there was a time when a science paper appeared written by um, a Dr. Reddick working with Jim Berenson at UCLA and for two years when the, the great, the grandfathers of myeloma would give a talk and one of whom is Robert Kyle at Mayo Clinic and would say, well, as we all now know, myeloma is caused by HHV8. It was very elegant in that this virus was thought to um, infect bone marrow dendritic cells, which then would release interleukin-6 and set this process in motion, but it could not be reproduced. I uh, talked to Bob Gallo, I said, well, these were not really uh, immunologists and virologists, uh, what do you think about it? And he didn't think much about it. There are rare familial occurrences. We are, since I've joined here, there are two or three families and I actually couldn't get anybody interested to study those patients. This is sort of the cartoon that shows that most myelomas, some say all myelomas, develop from a benign precursor lesion that the late uh, Jan Waldenstrom just called benign monoclonal gammopathy instead of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or MGAS. It has always been difficult for me to accept that a person at age 16, my youngest patient ever was 13 at diagnosis, that their etiopathogenesis would be the same as in somebody who has been around this world for decades. But this is still the current uh, thinking. We have done extensive genomic studies over the years to really look whether the very young and the very old differed transcriptionally or and we could not really find uh, this, but I think it deserves to be further investigated. The stroma plays an important role, as is indicated here by angiogenesis. Um, the MGAS condition, so this is the benign gammopathy, is not very much different in its stroma from that of age-matched normal controls, but it gets altered once the angiogenic process keep, uh, kicks in. 
there are two major uh, molecular <coughs> groups. One is hyperdiploid and involves usually on metaphase karyotyping the odd numbered chromosomes and then there are the translocations pertaining to the other 50%. And in the process, as time goes on, there are multiple mutations acquired, especially also mutations of the MYC oncogene that either pairs with the immunoglobulin heavier light chains or with other uh, genes. So this is uh, sort of a schema, how one diagnoses MGAS and smoldering myeloma, SMM and real myeloma. This is quite arbitrary and there have been lots of consensus uh, conferences on this and articles. Um, I think we will probably end up with something that's more biologically and genetically relevant. But important to remember that the probability of benign gammopathy where patients just are found to have a monoclonal protein, minimal level of bone marrow involvement and no end organ damage, uh, this uh, can last forever and people in Holland did a study in the city of Leiden where people over age 80 were studied and they found I think a 40% incidence. So I probably have this at age 72, although a cab driver in New York told me, he said, how old are you? I said, 72. He said, man, you look like 80. <laughs> You know, that's what Monsina does to you, I guess. <laughs> so we conducted a um, study as part of the Southwest Oncology Group. This was an intergroup observational study headed by Madhav Dodapkar, who worked in our program, is now Chair of Hematology at Yale. And we found uh, genetic features in purified C138 positive cells that could distinguish among smoldering patients those who had a high propensity for progression to clinical disease as shown on your left panel in red. Dr. Dudapkar um, left us to work at Rockefeller with uh, Dr. Um, Steinman, Ralph Steinman, who has since passed, and he then studied the immunology of uh, this uh, precursor condition. And as you can see in the various panels, when patients had anti SOX2 T cells present in red panel A, they had a slower and uh, <coughs> progression to and lower level of clinical disease. This pertains also to tetanus antibody, to EBNA, and on the bottom uh, relates to whether the immunoglobulin levels were high or low. Uh, of interest nowadays in the era of immune checkpoint inhibition, PDL1 is expressed on myeloma cells, PD1 on uh, various host cells, and you can see when PDL1 on tumor cells is low in blue, the probability of progression to clinical disease is low. Then he wrote a New England Journal paper on Gaucher's. Many, many years ago, I was invited to a dinner talk in Los Angeles by somebody who worked on Gaucher's. And I thought, what does that have to do with myeloma? Well, in the meeting, I was the only, I was the speaker and the host was the only, there were just two of us, no audience, which is kind of, I don't think many people have experienced this, but I learned a little bit about Gaucher's. 
And uh, this is an interesting observation where uh, patients with Gaucher's uh, do have a higher incidence of monoclonal gammopathy. We are following two patients at this moment at this institution and the mechanism uh, has to do with the LGL1. So that's a uh, peculiar model leading to myeloma, and I think some of you are interested in this. Clinical disease, CRAB, stands for hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, bone disease. Those are the features end, causing end organ damage and the, we call this clinical myeloma. There are recurrent infections, etc. The diagnostic workup is known to you. One gets in the old country of Germany where I grew up, everybody had a SED rate. And if the SED rate was greater than 80, then it was clear, rule out myeloma or Waldenstrom. You know, wasn't so, now we, and we don't do this. I don't know why, it's, we had to, do our own sed rate, you know, draw blood and then measure the sedimentation rate and make our little diagnosis. Um, the myeloma protein has to be evaluated. Uh, the bone marrow exam has to be performed. When I worked in Houston in our department, uh, we didn't take care of myeloma, but Dr. Alex Zanian worked in the traditional internal medicine department and they actually didn't do bone marrows because it wouldn't have any consequence, right? That's what they thought. And imaging by standard x-rays is not very helpful because it detects disease at the very far advanced stages when 70% or more of the calcium is gone. Here's some pretty pictures of plasma cells some people have tried a la lymphoma to grade this and come up with different types of myeloma based on morphology and all these efforts have failed. Typical serum and urine protein electrophoresis with a monoclonal protein and then immunofixation analysis. Dr. Charlie gave me this uh, picture here showing one can now measure the serum free light chains, an important advance uh, in uh, studying the disease. I don't think it is known whether patients, let us say, with an IgG kappa monoclonal protein who also have a free kappa only, whether these, um, whether they uh, derive from the same tumor cells, that is, does one cell make both the complete immunoglobulin and also just failing to assemble and the light chain are, are these two different populations? One can actually study this and make a contribution. I've asked my pathology friends to do this, but it hasn't happened. Um, the traditional karyotype is shown uh, in the upper left corner, the sky karyotype, uh, you can, using uh, various uh, gene probes, you can see there are many uh, numeric abnormalities. There are tetrasomies of certain chromosomes. Usually the odd number of chromosomes are involved, and one can also discern the uh, translocation and other structural aberrations. At diagnosis, about a third of patients do have metaphase chromosome abnormalities. There are seats here on the, in the front row. I'm, I'm easy. Um, and with each and every relapse, the frequency of, uh, see some of them listen actually, uh, uh, rises so that at the end stage of the disease, which nowadays is typically one of extra medullary disease, so where the myeloma escapes and can grow outside the bone marrow microenvironment, virtually 100% of patients have an abnormal karyotype. 
interface fish analysis can be done on interface cells and uh, n nucleoid is seen in virtually 100%. My colleague Dr. Shaughnessy and I, when in Arkansas, developed gene expression profiling of highly purified plasma cells and defined a risk score in terms of outcome, which I will come back to later. But we also could identify uh, genes that were associated with bone disease, one of which uh, on the right top is DKK1 or DICOP1, which led to a New England Journal paper that was so poorly written by us that uh, Bob Schwartz, the associate editor, thought it was so good, so he, wrote, he rewrote the entire paper and ended up being a good paper. So this is just to summarize, there are certain translocations that are recurrent on your left, and there are adverse uh, genetic abnormalities, uh, hypodiploid meaning less, fewer than the modal chromosome number is less than 46. Sometimes there is an MDS type karyotype feature within a myeloma karyotype. They are done very poorly, such as a deletion 5, uh, trisomy 8, and so forth. So this is uh, how modern imaging applies to myeloma. I think we have been the trailblazer on this beginning in uh, uh, Houston. When I started taking care of patients with myeloma, I went to Houston do, to do acute leukemia. I said, well, why not do this? And so insurance wouldn't pay, but I was not caught. Uh, and after five or six months, there was enough evidence, and all of a sudden, it mattered. So you can see this on your left, the focal lesions in white. And on your right, a PET scan. That looks really dangerous. Myeloma doesn't look so gentle when you see this kind of a PET scan. Uh, one of our colleagues in, did this work, I think it's published uh, now. We recognize that patients with myeloma treated in the same fashion have vastly different outcomes. Some die early, some die late. And so there is interclonal variation among patients. But when one studies the myeloma in a given patient and, as we have done, obtain marrow from the iliac crest, not under guidance, but blindly, we call this a random marrow, and compares this with fine needle aspiration examination take, taken from FDG hot areas on PET scan, then in the very same patient, the genetics can differ. So in this case here, on your left, you see that the uh, lesion from a hot area has a high-risk GEP or gene expression profiling. The tumor suppressor gene TP53 is deleted. And the patient had a translocation type myeloma, whereas the random marrow on the right from the left iliac crest was very different. There was a BRAF mutation that was not present in the hot focal lesion. For this reason, in order to characterize a newly diagnosed patient fully, I do obtain random marrow and two or three fine needle aspiration examinations because one wants to know the angriest type of myeloma in a given patient because that's going to kill the patient. So that ought to dictate the treatment one applies. Uh, Renal failure can come about by many different mechanisms. Cas nephropathy, when there's excess a light chain uh, secretion, and when this is uh, detected early, it's uh, readily irreversible. 
the amyloid condition. There's another condition similar to amyloid called light chain deposition disease that is more often kappa related with low levels of circulating uh, uh, light chains. Hypercalcemia can pr promote this and certain intervention can. Uh, this is a case of CAS nephropathy. Uh, this, uh, I guess, is a light chain deposition disease, and this is amyloid. The myeloma bone disease is an issue of balance. Uh, the DKK1 that I referred to earlier, published in the New England Journal, was the first uh, molecule that actually was known to in activate osteoblasts, whereas other studies bef before uh, had been associated with osteoclast activation. Then there's a staging system. It uh, used to be a Dury salmon staging system. Uh, Sid Salmon, uh, who died of pancreatic cancer, he worked at Tucson, Arizona good friend of ours, and um, this was more complicated. The international staging system relies on the serum beta-2 microglobulin, which is shed from the surface of myeloma cells, and uh, the concentration in the serum hence reflects tumor bulk. It's influenced by renal function. The albumin is a, a molecule that's produced in the liver and in the presence of interleukin-6, this can be decreased. And this has been revised recently to include in the staging system the importance of certain cytogenetic aberrations and also of LDH. We discovered some 20 years ago that patients with high LDH in myeloma often had extra medullary disease. So this was a telltale sign to uh, study patients then with CT scan, nowadays with PET CT scan. Our contributions to myeloma therapy, our, I include Dr. Jagannath, whom I have worked with uh, since my days at MD Anderson and who uh, joined me to move to Little Rock, recruited by Thomas E. Andrioli as division head of Heem Ong, and then I kind of couldn't handle his control, and so we started a separate Maloma Institute, which he has never forgiven me a little. All right, so Dr. Jagannath uh, discovered and performed outpatient transplants. Uh, we showed that uh, they can be safely given in the elderly and also to patients in renal failure. So this was the first effective salvage therapy utilizing high-dose dexamethasone, vincristin, and adriamycin. And as a an, uh, young kid originally from Germany, you get a New England Journal paper that really pumps you up. So that's when some people at least get hooked, and that was my hooker. Um, here a patient um, on your left with plasma cell leukemia. In those days, we harvested marrow. Her marrow uh, had 30% plasma cells, and we used this very marrow to perform the transplant, reasoning that the plasma cells are not proliferating and uh, have a very low clonogenic fraction. And in fact, the patient lived seven years later. This is the first, then, because we were close to St. Jude Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, they had uh, under Don Pinkel, 
who also later worked at MD Anderson, they started what they called total therapy. So whenever they discovered something that worked in relapsed ALL or AML, then they would put this right up front and they are now on total therapy, maybe 17 or something. But our total therapy approach is taken from that philosophy and here's the first paper in a non-randomized but controlled study comparing this with a Southwest Oncology trial. Um, I had a patient from New York, cardiologist, who uh, at age 40 something he had nasty myeloma. It was at the time that Judah Folkman was quoted in the New York Times and elsewhere about his work on anti-angiogenesis. They were molecules like angiostatin and endostatin used, but they were in the experimental stage. So the wife, a hotshot lawyer, said, Bart, you now called Judah Folkman. I said, yes, ma'am. And uh, he said, Bart, uh, you can use thalidomide. So that got us going on thalidomide. It didn't work on that patient, but we had gone through the rigmarole of uh, uh, all the uh, technical things that needed to be done in the next patient, as you can see from single agent thalidomide, presenting with a hemoglobin of five, et cetera, after uh, two or three months, the patient entered complete remission. And I always think the, there's a lot of power to those anecdotes. One ought to pay attention to those. So I give you now a little spiel here on what we have done. So total therapy one, the, these trials all were based on uh, two autotransplants using melphalan, for which there was a clear dose response. So the more melphalan one gave, the more uh, anti-tumor activity one could elicit. Uh, Tim McElwain from England started high-dose melphalan without stem cell support, and this was published in The Lancet, and our little contribution was to give stem cells, make this safer, and increase the dose. And you can see here, there was some evolution. Total therapy two introduced uh, the question about thalidomide in a randomized trial. Total therapy three added the proteasome inhibitor uh, valcate. And these are the patient's characteristics. Uh, these are overall survival on your left and progression-free survival. And you can see the blue curve is total therapy one and there are patients uh, who are seeing us who were on this trial and some of these patients are out 25 to 30 years and the curve is flat. When one looks at traditionally curable diseases and looks at survival curves or progression-free survival curve, there's always a, it's never totally flat. There's always an event, whether this is a new type of ALL or other causes of death remains to be seen. Uh, Dr. Crowley in Seattle modeled this, and this was published in Blood in 2014, I believe. And in this uh, wild bull, I think, model, he, uh, uh, the reviewer in Blood, Bob Löwenberg, accepted that these curves were compatible with curability. Um, so then the issue is, this is fairly heavy treatment. So the induction, the transplants, consolidation, it takes about six, eight months, and then there's three years of maintenance therapy. So one would like to find uh, surrogates that tell us 
is somebody perhaps cured at an earlier point in time and one can get by without all of this bombastic treatment. So there's a minimal residual disease test that has been developed. It's being examined. My reservation to it is that as patients have focal lesions on MRI and PET scan and the MRD is done on randomly procured marrow, it doesn't make much sense when you still have disease on an MRI and you have MRD negativity. So there are some issues with this. Anyhow, we decided we look at a bone marrow biopsy based approach assuming that the uh, cleaning up of the marrow of uh, myeloma cells does not necessarily come to a curative signature because the bone marrow microenvironment is still inflicted by the former presence in it by, of the myeloma cells. So we published this and here we did gene expression profiling of whole bone marrow biopsies and when the features were uh, comparable with those of age and gender matched controls, you can see on your right, those people in blue had a superior complete remission duration. Um, we also found some predictors of second malignancies. We looked, um, it is usually believed that the uh, second malignancies such as MDS and acute leukemia are the result of myeloma therapy. But here we actually uh, examined the marrow prior to any therapy and we could find a gene BCL11A that when expressed at a low level was associated with a higher level and incidence of uh, MDS and AML. Um, this uh, slide portrays the difference in outcome among, on your left, among patients, among the 85% of patients presenting with low risk disease where cure is readily obtained Contrasting this with the 15% having high risk disease, and you can see the transition from one total therapy program to the next made no damn difference. The median progression free survival is maintained at just two months. Uh, in multivariate analysis, the uh, gene expression profiling entered the model very strongly. Uh, for all the endpoints indicated here, along with uh, traditional metaphase karyotyping. Extra medullary disease is now being encountered with increasing frequency, especially liver involvement, peripancreatic, perirenal. Uh, There's something about the mesentery, uh, testis, lymph nodes, and CNS. And um, I mean, in the interest of time, uh, patients who present de novo with extra medullary disease, you only can diagnose this if you will perform PET scanning. And they have a miserable uh, outcome. So far, I conclude that uh, myeloma has joined the club of curable cancers and uh, we need to see how do we deal with the high-risk disease. And uh, drug companies uh, typically don't want to invest in a minority of uh, patients, that is 15%, who have high-risk disease, but they like to see success. So this has been a difficult 
uh, uh, road. Here I'm showing you by the um, ovals that the relapse in high-risk disease happens at every stage from the first induction cycle to the next, from the first transplant to the next and so forth. For this reason, we then introduced the concept of less dose intense but more dose dense therapy so that the patient would be consistently treated and there was always drug on board. This was a, did not succeed. And then we asked what, where next? <clears throat> We uh, treated a patient who ended up dying at this institution, um, Jeff Jones, whose name I can use. Um, he had developed liver disease, and we had treated him with uh, Dr. Freireich, my mentor, made me run the GI service once, so I knew how to give intrahepatic artery infusion chemotherapy and embolization. So I did this for this guy a few times. And we had just begun to do mutational analysis, and this guy exhibited, I believe, a <clears throat> BRAF mutation treated with the melanoma drug trametinib or mechanist, and he achieved a complete remission within one month. Powerful. Some of the new drugs, the uh, anti-CD38 antibody daratumumab, here in combination with a new immunomodulatory agent you see the majority of patients respond. And then I try to give you a couple of cases here. So this is a currently 85-year-old white gentleman from uh, College Station, Texas. He uh, got treated with proteasome inhibitor therapy and when he came to us here, he had disease in lymph nodes, striated muscles, skin, on hemodialysis. No bone disease. The bone marrow was clean. So we gave him a little chemotherapy, collected cells, improved a bit, gave him a mini autotransplant, achieved PR, and then he had a further massive extra medullary disease, EMD relapse. And he then received the monoclonal antibody, single agent aratumumab, and he was in CR four weeks later. This is here, this uh, looks almost like sarcomatous uh, from a lymph node, I believe, of the left neck. And uh, here you can see the PET scan and the normalization of the PET scan within less than a month from single agent daratumumab. This is huge. This is as huge or shouldn't say huge or more huge uh, than um, rituximab in the B cell lymphoma area. Here's another dude, as we say in Arkansas. He uh, came to us from Montana, a farmer, and we gave him chemotherapy, best that we knew. He had no response. In fact, this was the marrow after a cycle of chemotherapy, packed. He gets a little daratumumab, and he continues in complete remission. Here you can see the corresponding uh, PET scan. So, um, based on our hypothesis that when one gives strongly myelosuppressive therapy, for the marrow to recover, there is a cytokine storm being released in order to establish normal hematopoiesis 
These cytokines, however, are not just recognizing normal bone marrow cells, but they also, as they include IL-6 and others, can stimulate uh, and turn into proliferation residual myeloma cells. So we started this with a thalidomide and then developed this low-dose continuous infusion 28-day regimen. And uh, Dr. Um, uh, Julia Feldstein did some of the staining here. And you can see there is indeed an anti-angiogenic effect. We use very low doses of cisplatin and adriamycin, one milligram per meter squared over 28 days. No hair loss, uh, some autonomous nervous system toxicity from the uh, bortezomib. This is a little old man, primary plasma cell leukemia, high risk. Uh, with extramedullary disease. He got this treatment and he uh, entered uh, complete remission. Uh, then we have recognized some agents that are useful for the treatment of sister diseases of myeloma such as CLL and venetoclax targets the anti-apoptosis gene BCL2, and this is now also being investigated in multiple myeloma. There was a presentation at the last American Society of Hematology meeting in uh, uh, San Diego on an AIDS drug, Nelfinavir, that Swiss investigators added to bortezomib and had exciting results. So we have added this uh, to the metronomic therapy. We have the, met the daratumumab in it and the venetoclax. And we have seen um, single uh, cycle complete remissions that are then maintained with immune checkpoint inhibitors, etc. Um, there are patients who still have residual disease. I saw somebody from Philly yesterday, and he is on immunotherapy, still has high risk disease. Had he been on chemotherapy, this would have taken off. But I propose that immunotherapy does not obey the resistance mechanisms of genotoxic drugs, that high-risk designation for standard therapy may not pertain to immunotherapy, and, and so on. Uh, we know that the mutation burden increases with disease progression there's a higher mutation burden in high-risk disease, and this may imply greater immunogenicity. And uh, um, Bo Bali and I are working on some of these aspects. And with this, I'd like to thank you for coming and wanted to thank the patients, my former and current colleagues, and I always thank my Dr. Freireich, whose only problem is that he voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> thank you. Questions? Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> as you probably know, at Sinai, we have a program on geriatrics and therefore linked to aging. And your subject is about, obviously about an older person's blood cancer. So my question for you is, mm -hmm. are you or your colleagues looking at the age and aging aspect of myeloma? Well, indirectly, uh, we adjust the, our treatment approaches to the overall condition. Age per se 
does not dictate, in my view, how one treats somebody. But, as I mentioned earlier, I would be very interested how old people differ from the younger generation in terms of their entire makeup, and we haven't uh, found this, but I think it's time to re-examine uh, the question. So, so, so you showed earlier on that um, anti-SOX uh, to T cells had an impact on outcome. So what is the role of the T cell? Does it require a diseased or abnormal B cell and then a pro-inflammatory T cell clone or to, to drive that process? or? They are probably a subclonal. Um, I'm not an immunologist to answer this question uh, as Dr. Andrio to Dr. Andrioli's satisfaction. <laughs> but Dr. Parikh or Cho are here. Maybe they can address this. Okay. But they left already. They found this boring. <laughs> <laughs> You've probably heard it before. <laughs> So when you have a patient in complete remission and you're now looking for minimal residual disease, do you do MRIs and PET scans and then try to go after anything that lights up? Yes. So a PET scan as using the fluorodeoxyglucose uh, normalizes very quickly with effective therapy. can happen in a in a week, when one does MRI and has a patient in, gets the patient into complete remission, the time to disappearance of focal lesions on MRI is a year and a half median. And we have stuck needles into those residual MRI lesions and 20 or 30 percent of the time they actually contain viable myeloma cells. But other times, the majority of the time, they are just shadows and the MI measures water. Uh, but that's yeah, right. Thank you very much for Thank you for having me.